And one of the things that I really appreciate is the fact that you are connecting the dots. So, you know, um, a lot of times people subspecialize, they do a lot of research and they get into their one area and become extremely expert in that space. And one of the things I respect so much about what you've done, Rob, is taken all of your experiences in research and clinical experiences, as well as integrate the knowledge from so many different areas, um, even around the world, and then integrate it for us and connect the dots and clarify so many confusing topics. So one of the things, and then we're not gonna talk about injectables anymore, one of the things that you said, which really helped me, and I think might help other physicians as well, is somebody asked you a question about your thoughts about the injectable medications. And you gave an answer, which I thought was so helpful because you started with, depends on the hat I wear. Right. You described three mm -hmm. different, I've never right. thought of answering that way, but that's exactly how physicians want to be able to answer. Well, so mind sharing? It, not at, not at all. That's a, this this is a common issue, and you know the answer is I'm very conflicted about these because I wear three different hats, and what hat I wear at any given moment dictates what I would say about the medications. All right, so Ozempic, Wagovi, Manjaro, Zepbound, yet others yet to come down the line, okay, and they're more coming. Um, are they good or are they bad? Well, again, it depends what kind of hat, what, what hat I'm wearing. So as a clinician, I'm glad they're here, okay? Because there are people who need them. And, you know, if you need them, you need them. And chances are, if you need them, you know you need them because you've tried everything else. And because obesity is a risk factor, it's not the cause, but it is a risk factor for multiple pathologies, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, cardiovascular disease, cancer, dementia, fatty liver disease, polycystic ovarian disease, Crohn's disease, autoimmune disease, and the list goes on, mm -hmm. getting weight down will help mitigate many of those pathologies, okay? And we have people who are, more, you know, in morbid uh, conditions who are even at death's door. And so as a clinician, I am committed to helping those people. And so the fact that these medicines actually do work as opposed to the medicines that have you know, been there before that really didn't work. And of course, all the snake oil that's been out there that, of course, you know, really didn't work. OK, this is a welcome addition. So from a clinical standpoint, I'm glad they're here now. From a science standpoint, it's a little bit different because I'm a scientist too. First question, why do they work? Why do they work? All right, they work in two places. They work at the brain, okay, and they seem to calm the chatter. And part of that is by actually inhibiting the nucleus accumbens. And that sounds like a very good thing. And it might very well be a very good thing. Because if it calms the food chatter, okay, then people are not going to be consumed with the notion of, you know, what's the next meal. Okay? And they can actually hopefully be more productive and, you know, be able to actually, you know, walk away from the buffet. So that sounds good. But the fact is that there are many cases, mostly anecdotal, but nonetheless, many cases of people who have basically lost interest in other things, too, and have gotten major clinical depression. Now, I've seen studies that say that that doesn't exist, but the anecdotes do. Whether it's you know science or whether it's anecdote is still yet to be determined. But nonetheless, it is suppressing that reward center to such an extent that there might actually be problems. And we, obesity physicians, have a history with suppressing the nucleus accumbens. In 2006, there was a drug that was um, available on the market in Europe, never approved here in the United States. It was called Romanabant. It was an endocannabinoid antagonist. It was the anti-marijuana drug. It was the anti-munchies drug. And it really did a very good job with weight loss. And it got approved in the uh, EU. And within two months of its approval, there were 21 suicides because of Romanovant. 
And what they came to realize is if you suppress the reward system, there ain't nothing to live for. So this is still a question and we still have to answer it. So the fact that it works on the brain sounds like a good thing, but in certain cases may not be. All right. Where else does it work? Well, it works on the GI tract. And what it does is it delays gastric emptying. Now, that also sounds good because if you delay gastric emptying, that means that you haven't pushed the food from breakfast through at lunchtime. Therefore, you're not going to be hungry for lunch because breakfast is still sitting there. And that might be true, but it also might not because that's why you have the nausea. That's why you have the vomiting post universal in terms of when these pa when patients start on these medicines. But you also have the pancreatitis, which is not rare. It's, I mean, it's not super common, but it's not rare. It's about one to 2%. That's not rare. Okay. Rare is like one in a thousand, one in 5,000, one in 10,000. But if you're at one in a hundred one in, or one in 50, you know, that's not good. And then lastly, one that is rare, but unbelievably uh, uh, worrisome is gastroparasis. That is stomach turning to stone. Okay. And if you get that, okay, not only can you not eat, not only end up in the hospital on IV hydration because you can't keep anything down, but when you stop the medication, it doesn't go away. So this is sort of the dreaded uh, you know, uh, uh, complication or side effect of this medicine. And at this point in time, we can't figure out who's going to be in that boat or not. So from a science standpoint, I have to worry about the toxicities. And so those are the toxicities. In addition, these medicines cause both fat loss, which is good. They also cause muscle loss. They cause equal amounts of fat and muscle loss. Now, Fat loss is good. Muscle loss is not. Ask any little old lady who breaks her hip if she wishes she had a little more muscle. Okay? Muscle loss is not a good thing. So what else causes muscle loss? Starvation. Starvation causes fat and muscle loss in equal amounts too. And that's probably how these medicines are working. It's causing starvation. Okay? And the reason is because of this delay gastric emptying. So it all comes back to that. So is this the best way to lose fat? Not clear to me. Okay. Still, jury's still out. Okay. And then finally, the public health hat. Now I'm going to switch hats again, and I'm going to put my third hat on. Public health hat. If everyone in America who qualified for a GLP-1 analog actually got it, that would be a surcharge of $2.1 trillion to the healthcare system, which is currently at $4.1 trillion. So that would be a 50% surcharge on top of what we're already paying. And we can't even pay that because Medicare will be broke by the year 2026 and Social Security will be broke by the year 2034. So this is an extraordinarily expensive modality to achieve what is tantamount to a 16% weight loss. Now, we've never had anything that came close to a 16% weight loss. So, you know, I'm very clear on the fact that these medicines are efficacious, I'm not saying no, but not everybody responds, number one. But nonetheless, they are, they are efficacious for a majority of people, and that's good. However, if we in this country just got added sugar consumption from its current 19 teaspoons per day down to the USDA guidelines of 12 teaspoons per day. That's all, just a seven teaspoon per day reduction. That's so be a 33% reduction in total sugar consumed. We could effectuate a 29% weight loss and save 3.0 trillion dollars a year. So that's a 5.1 trillion dollar swing for something that's completely safe and saves money and versus something that causes significant side effects and basically breaks the bank. So to me 
This is really a public health issue, and we need public health solutions. And Ozempic, Wagovi, Mandaro, and Zepbound are not public health solutions. Yeah. And then lastly, of course, the fact that you gain the weight back. And the reason is because no one has GLP-1 deficiency. You know, yes, we're, we, it's, it's, it's dealing with the problem by bypassing the problem. We have to target the problem. The thing I have learned in all of my years as a physician is that you have to target the pathology in order to see benefit.